one of the big picture things you talk about that I think is really interesting is building a roadmap when it comes to external communication into the development process. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think one thing that's been really exciting about working at Rose City Games is that community has always been a part of the plan. Um, a lot of the studio members we've met as a result of the community that we have in Portland here around Indie Games. And so when creating the studio, when I joined, um, that was something that was always apparent. Like we work with the community here when we're developing our games and we want to engage with the community when we're putting the games out for the world to see and we want to hear what people say and and what they think about it so we can provide the best experience that, that we can. Um, what we do is throughout the development of the game, we're constantly looking at events, um, previously both physical and digital, now just digital. Um, we're looking at opportunities to engage with our community during um, different so like social beats and platforms. And we really try to make sure that basically we just are keeping them in touch and keeping them up to date on what's going on with the game because we found at least for our community they get really excited about seeing what's happening and even if it's a work in progress they just want to know what's going on and so our goal is to throughout the development um, and not just at specific points communicate with them and and let them know that we're excited about what they're going to play eventually what kind of feedback do you get throughout that process that reinforces that this mm -hmm. is the right approach for communication for you um, I mean, it's just sort of a lot of it is sentiment and tone. Um, we do a lot of work in between because, you know, there's so much time between announcing a game and the actual release of the game. And so if you don't necessarily have something for them to play, um, it's really important to just see what kind of comments are they leaving on social media? What, how are they responding to the announcements or updates that you've put on Steam? Um, what are they saying in your Discord? And so sometimes um, we'll have community contests or giveaways. Um, I try to be a little bit sporadic with those because they can be a little bit superficial in terms of engagement. But in addition to that, if folks are commenting on our gifts, if they're engaging with the posts, that, mean they're ex that means they're excited. Um, we also have moved into exploring streaming, both on Twitch and on Steam. And being able to engage with folks there has been really helpful because we, with Floppy Nights, we've started showing off progress of the game and showing how we do testing, for example, how we look for bugs and how we record it. And it's funny because we didn't know if anyone would be interested because, you know, it's repeating the same process in a game, kind of breaking it over and over, uh, but people are excited. And so just being flexible and receptive um, and letting them know when we do hear their feedback uh, that we're excited that we hear it because if they understand that we're listening, they're more apt to provide even more feedback. What examples can you cite when it comes to giving back to the community and reinforcing to them, hey, we're listening, we're taking in your feedback. What are some examples of things that you've done? Uh, a lot of it has to do with integrating what we've done with events, particularly Steam festivals and, and the feedback that we're hoping to get. Uh, one specific example that comes to mind is the latest, I guess, winter Steam Game Festival that happened. Uh, we had, in a previous Steam Festival, gotten specific feedback on our demo, and we had two specific goals. Um, see how the feedback had changed as a result of the changes we made on the previous demo, and then uh, see what else folks would say about all of the new things we added. And so what we hope to continue to do is we created a survey. I worked with the team to uh, create a survey that made sense that they could use uh, with the feedback that we get. And then throughout the entire festival, we plug that survey everywhere on our streams, in our announcements, our updates, uh, on our Twitter and in our Discord. And so we really let folks know that this is something that was important to us. And we reinforce that by um, throughout the Steam Festival, giving these little tidbits of, hey, we noticed that everyone's favorite character is Barrel Cactus, trying not to influence perhaps any of their views, but um, providing the tidbits of more of the fun questions that we were asking. And seeing that engage them also, and it also reminded them like, oh, if I hadn't done the survey, I should go do that because my yeah. favorite character is, you know, Spatunia, the flower, and I don't want Barrel Cactus to win. So finding ways to reinforce that again throughout the process and not just at the very beginning or at the very end is really important. 
Um, and at the very end of the STEAM Festival, what we did was uh, I was really explicit in our Discord. I said, hey, uh, and on our STEAM announcements, actually, I said, hey, we're compiling all this feedback. Next week during our update, I am going to get back to you with everything that we learned. So stay tuned. And so we're letting them know and really walking them through this process that we're here, we're listening, um, and we follow through. So we made sure that the next week we had a infographic that I created that took a lot of the uh, graphs that our survey feedback survey had, as well as a lot of the themes that we saw. And it was really high level. Uh, a lot of it wasn't stuff, I think, from maybe a developer standpoint, it seems like very superficial, but for a community member, that's really exciting to hear that, oh, hey, this was a comment that I put on Steam and they quoted it in their infographic. That's really exciting. Um, and again, it gets, just goes back to making sure they feel heard. How have you pivoted? Because you mentioned a little bit earlier about events and obviously events look a little bit differently right now. And when we're going from you know, there's a, there is a difference between interacting with people in person at an event, at a conference, and then doing it virtually, much like we're doing here. Um, what are some of the lessons you've learned as you've had to move your communications to be solely virtual? And how have you transferred events in that way so that you can still get the same out of it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Because one thing that I realized, we had always wanted to and prioritized as much as we could communication with folks. Um, and a lot of that happened at physical events. So we would be heading to the PAXs, the GDCs, you know, all of these events that were sort of the hallmarks or sort of milestones of the, the year. And while we got really great feedback, I loved being able to see people's reactions live. It was fun getting to meet a lot of folks who had played our games. Um, I realized at physical events, we were only limited to the people who could afford to go to the events, were in the geography, um, who had time off of work. And there were a lot of factors that limited the breadth of the audience that we could have. And so one thing that I've appreciated, even though I do miss those physical events, um, is that moving to digital events has shown us that there was a whole part of our community or potential part of our community that we weren't accessing and that we weren't communicating with as regularly because we were more focused on preparing for these physical events. And so when we transitioned, um, especially last year, we focused on improving our Discord. We did a whole revamp. Um, we added more mods. We you know, did a pass through on our community guidelines. Um, and with each Steam Festival, we added a little bit to our toolkit and our repertoire of what we hope to do. So at first we primarily focused on announcements and maybe a couple of live streams. Um, and now we're, we're always live streaming during the events. Uh, we're always putting up announcements. We're exploring potential ways to use some of the newer tools like the beta weekends and um, really just trying to find ways to continuously connect with people online because there's so many people that we wouldn't have reached otherwise. You've brought up STEAM tools, and I'm curious to hear how you view STEAM tools as a part of your bigger communication plan, and how, how do you treat STEAM and the tools that are involved with STEAM? And um, I'm hoping maybe there are some takeaways in how you use it for other devs to be thinking about the fact that there are different ways to use it, and it's not a one-size-fits-all necessarily. Yeah, initially we focused on just using the updates announcements um, section and that honestly is our our bread and butter um we consistently post updates whether it's mini dev dev updates showing just quick gifts of things that we're working on in the game um, as well as bigger announcements uh, for example if we have a festival we're participating in um, anything of that nature and that's something that i think folks have come to expect and they come back and they know that okay i know that this is a game that's being active it's being worked on because they have a sort of living document essentially that's tracking all of the stuff they're doing here in steam um, and i think that that does feel at least i know i'm noticing it now more when games are updating their announcements and it doesn't have to be super often. You know, if there's an event, I'll do it a bit more frequently, but I generally try to do it only once a month. Um, and throughout the month, just pick up a GIF here, pick up a screenshot there, and at the end, just put it all together, uh, which does take a little bit of practice and training. But once you have it, it, it hopefully doesn't take too long. In addition to that, um, we found that the Steam streaming has been really useful. I really have enjoyed and 
loved comparing it to reaching out to streams on on Twitch. While people don't think of Steam as a streaming platform, I think what's really important about it is that people are on Steam because they're looking for games, so they already have the intent and sort of the mentality of they're looking for something they want to play. And um, the friction to clicking that wishlist button or finding out more about the game is so low. Um, while Twitch is really helpful and I think really important to connect with members of the content creator community, to connect with maybe people who haven't, you know, don't scroll through Steam as much, um, I think it is really difficult to, from Twitch or any other platform, even social media, uh, get them over to Steam to wishlist. And so I've learned that um, having our streams up on Steam, having dev moments, dev streams that are there so that community members can feel like they interact with our devs there. Um, that's really important as well. And how do you value um, moderators and influencers and uh, streamers as you use these tools and even as you use tools outside of Steam? We, we love, <laughs> we love, love, love our moderators uh, and any streamers we work with. Um, it's really a big part of us building our community um, because a when it comes down to it we are a brand we're trying to sell people things um, and so I think what really helps is finding um, on the moderator side moderators who understand our values as a studio who understand what we're trying to do with our games so that they can um, be in our uh, discord and really help foster that sense of community that we're trying to go for and with streamers um, We're really intentional about who we pick to stream our games. Um, I have a roster of streamers that are like Just people who I know will knock it out of the park and they're not always the biggest streamers I think what's really important is also to make sure that even if a streamer is small, they may have a more engaged community they may have um folks who really, really listen to them and value their opinion, perhaps more than a streamer that has, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of people who watch, but maybe don't engage with the same sort of weight. And um, having these streamers being willing to stream on Steam, um, we'll often ask them as, uh, as Steam festivals happen, we'll say, hey, you know, we can't be live all the time, because I think that's another thing um, to think about with using Steam and streaming in general. Uh, you do not have to be the one who always streams your game. It's really neat for your community to watch the dev play and watch the dev comment. And I think that should be something if you're comfortable with. Um, you don't even have to be on camera. You can use just a picture avatar and just have your voice. Um, but if you have the ability to engage streamers and say, hey, could you steam on stream with, uh, or yeah, stream on steam <laughs> <That's> <laughs> for a little bit. Um, and and engage your community here that would be really appreciated um that goes a really long way uh and helps again reinforce your your game your tone and your your studio brand how just to get back a little bit to when you're using this at, at closer to the beginning of the development process and you're mm -hmm. engaging with the community whether it's um through social media or through steam how do you get to a place where you can accept critical feedback because if as a developer i know it would we've talked to several who say it's really tough sometimes to read some of the comments and then you also have to parse yeah. through <laughs> like what's a genuine criticism versus what is trolling versus all of that so what have you found mm -hmm. to be successful in in weeding through weeding through the feedback um if at all possible, if at all possible, hire a community manager. Um, I know I know there's a lot of factors that go into someone's ability to be able to get that as a resource for themselves as they're making a game. But um, to be to have someone who is separate from you being able to filter that for you is so important because not only does it take mental energy for you to read those comments to take them in, um, but then you have to go back and make your game and if that's weighing on you you don't want that to necessarily always influence what you're doing with your game um, there's a degree to which you, you should take feedback um, and so if you can hire a community manager i think that's a really great um, that is a great investment if you're not able to um, it's it's hard but i would say if possible make specific times to read that feedback um, and it's tough, but really try to train yourself to 
to identify, like, is this a member of a community who has commented before? Is this a member of community who is engaging with other things? Are they coming to me in good faith? Um, there, I think that is really important to start to evaluate when you're looking at feedback. And if there's someone totally brand new looking at just the quality, is this a one line? Is this is this just a throwaway? Like they type something because they could, <laughs> but they maybe wouldn't say it to someone's face. Um, so yeah, I would say block out a time for that when maybe you aren't going to be going into working on something specifically right after and and keeping it as separate as you can from your creative process because I do think it can impede the creative process if you're constantly looking at feedback without a filter. <laughs> it kind of gets into your head a little bit, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. And what other advice would you have for devs who, something we mentioned at the start of this talk was the importance of looking big picture at marketing and communications and making it a part of your development process throughout. Um, I would imagine there might be some devs who say either we don't have the bandwidth for that or we don't have the financial means to hire somebody or hire a few people who can who can focus on that. So what are some tips and tricks that you've learned along the way as far as ways that you can make your development process market for you? Uh, the biggest one is recycle your content, <laughs> reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, pretty much it's a habit that has to be formed, but um, capturing those screenshots, I mentioned it a little bit before, but capturing screenshots, capturing GIFs, something visual is always really good to have, um, even if it's not polished. Um, I know a lot of developers are a bit hesitant to put something that's not polished out, but I think the audience for the most part, especially with indie games, if you clarify that in your statement, you put a watermark in the corner somehow, um, most people will see a work in progress and be very excited about it. They just wanna see what's going on with your game. Um, in addition to that, getting into the habit of doing that frequently. Like if you have two week sprints, for example, or one week check-ins or whatever you like to call your process of when you sort of end your workflow for that time period, use that day or that time, take 30 minutes, 45 minutes, capture those gifts, write down what you did that week. So at the end of the month, that's a newsletter. That's a communication, that's a steam announcement that you could post. Um, and I would take all of those gifts that you make and put into your newsletter put all of those on social media. Um, it's also better to, I have found, at least for our community, that quality is better than quantity. Um, there was a point in time when we were posting things every day. We were trying twice a day. We were, you know, we experimented with all sorts of things. And eventually I realized that we were just flooding our, our audience. Um, and they eventually got to the point where they almost... It was almost like taking it for granted. Like they're like, oh, we saw another, you know, another thing from Rose City Games. They're always posting. And now we found, at least for our audience and the cadence that works for us, having like two really quality posts a week works better than posting every single day because then it becomes this like treat and something they look forward to. Um, and we can really make things special, feels a little bit more special. And it saves a lot of time on my part too. Nice. <laughs> um, and finally, I would say, think simple i have i have spent hours trying to capture like the perfect gameplay shot the moment that you know i think well oh this is gonna go so great on on twitter i think when i post it in our discord people are gonna love it and then it just flops and then i've done the ah this is a cute face that the character makes i'm just gonna post the facial expression you know the little a wink or something and everyone is loves it. And so I think what I've I've learned over time is um, simple resonates more than complex. If you have a gameplay video that you want to show, consider breaking it up into a lot smaller pieces. Maybe you have one video that shows the movement, one video, video that shows like a jump, um, keeping it to like one specific thing per GIF or per post helps you maximize your content because you're spreading it out a little bit, you know, a little bit thinner in that sense. But it also is easier for people to register and read and react to versus like a longer gameplay video. I'm wondering if you can um, give us a few more examples of the ways in which you have gotten creative in how you connect with the community 
and why those it was important to match those creative ways to the tone of the game or to the tone of your overall communication. Mm -hmm. Um. I mean, first of all, I've I've had I've been really lucky because I've had personally a lot of fun with each of the games we've worked on. I think um, it's important to find out why you're excited about a game, what what you are most looking forward to people experiencing, and then taking that as your starting point for how you can get creative. Because if that's your hook and that's what folks are resonating with, um, you want to lean into that. You want to utilize that. One thing that I found um, in particular with Garden Story was the fact that um, we we were doing newsletters and they were just kind of our standard like here's the dev update we worked on this this month uh, and that wasn't really resonating i mean people were reading it but um, i found it wasn't being as successful as our twitter for example and our social media where there's some really cute gifts and i noticed a lot of people saying and again it goes back to listening and to the sentiments that people have um, and a lot of people are like, oh, I wish I was here. This is such a nice, like, this is so cozy. And people sort of saying that they wanted to be in this world. And so um, between that sentiment and then a lot of what I saw, um, like Victoria Tran doing with some of the Boyfriend Dungeon work uh, and her newsletters was, um, it, it got me thinking about, why don't I do a newsletter that's like a newspaper from the world of the Grove? And so uh, we created newsletters and announcements that uh, we would send to our community, but instead of just being regular dev announcements, it, we called it the the Grove Guardian. <laughs> and so it's like this newspaper that shows what happened that month in the Grove. And so, you know, it takes a little bit more time in terms of you have to learn how to write in the voice of your characters and the voice of the world. but. It's been really fun because people will write back and they say, like, this is something that's so charming. I really look forward to reading this. Um, and it gets them more excited about the game um, in, in a more organic feeling way versus like we're selling something to them. You know, it was essentially doing the same thing, but it feels just a lot better and it matches the voice of of what we try to do as as a studio. So pretty excited about that. <laughs> That's so great because it sounds like what you're doing is valuing bringing the community in to be a part of the conversation rather than just talking at them. Yeah, I think the biggest thing we've learned, um, and we've said this kind of throughout this entire conversation, but um, yeah, as long as you're providing feedback back to your community, oftentimes we as developers ask for feedback. We're like, oh, our community is not talking to us. They're not talking with us. Um, and I think what's really important, and there is a growing pain. There is a growing curve, learning curve to it. Um, but not just expecting feedback from your community, but don't be afraid to ask them specifically what you need. What are you looking for? And then providing them feedback back on their feedback. It's this sort of yeah. two-way street that's really interesting. Um, and you do have to think of it as a conversation and as a relationship. And that conversation is going to look different from developer to developer because some devs really want to be involved with their community and like have every little part of development showcased. And you might be a dev that says, uh, I do like to have a little bit of distance. And so maybe I'm not going to communicate as often, but when I do communicate, this is how it's going to look. So that does also depend on your personal style. These have been some really great takeaways and I love all the examples that you've given about what have worked for, for you. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. So happy to, to be able to talk. <laughs>